Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the first of a double bill this evening. We are talking today about a bomb group. We have another show on Wednesday with Philip Brazier about another bomb group, so a specific bomb group in the 8th Air Force. Today, we're looking at the 381st and my two guests, because you get two for the price of one today, uh, Mike Peters, world-renowned world historian, battlefield guide, Army Air Corps veteran, etc., etc., and Paul Billing, um, who Bing, Bingley, God, we get words mixed up. Who is, of course, chairman of the Ridgewell Museum, commemorative museum there, and they have just published his book called Bomb Group. So I'm going to bring the gentleman in now. So, good evening, gents. How are you today? Very good, thanks, Paul. How are you? Yeah, great, thanks, Paul. Good well. to meet you. So, writing about a bomb group, um, you know, plenty of history of books about bomb groups, units, pilots, air, individual air crews, individual bases. Obviously, Paul, you come from a background about writing about Ridgewell already and, and with your work at the museum there, Mike, lots of work about gliders. First question, how did the two of you come together to, 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 to do this book? And, and B, how did you separate the, the, the work? I think, I think can I can lead on that, Paul. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it, Mike. Yeah, yeah so um, I, I pre-pandemic, I used to run... Uh, Battlefield Guide training courses, and, and Paul came along on one of the one-day inside courses, which is a classroom-based course, and started to tell me all about this airfield that he society that he ran, and it, his enthusiasm just really came out. I said, "Oh, I'd like to come down." And the pandemic kicked in, so we did a socially distanced battlefield tour around Ridgewell Airfield, and uh, Paul was just coming out with all this stuff. I said, "Surely, you, mate, you've got to write something about this." And he, he, he sort of was in an R, and we talked about Masters of the Air coming out, and all that. I said, "Well." If you don't do it, I'm going to do it. Or we, and, and he was like, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And then further down the street, Paul said, why don't we do it together? So I was like, wow, what a, what a, what a privilege. So we, we got together and started to talk about how to, how to do it. That's about it, isn't it, Paul? <laughs> yeah, and he kind of set me on this path. So I thought, why am I doing this? Because this is really hard work. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was actually so amazing to do. And, um, yeah, it was quite difficult at the beginning because we weren't really sure how we were going to write it because, you know, I've been chairman of this Ridgewell Airfield Museum for about five or six years and I kind of knew the stories of certain individuals and roughly what was happening with the 381st Bond Group. And Mike was coming, it, coming at it blind, really. I mean, you knew about the 8th Air Force, you knew uh, the commanders and this, that and the other, but not specifically the, the 381st. So it was... A, it was quite a task to kind of meld everything together uh, at the beginning. And I think we kind of stumbled on something that works. I think. Yeah, just, uh, I think um, it's interesting what you said in the intro, Paul, about there's lots and lots of books out there. And there are. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, most of them are pretty good. Most of them, some are very bad. But, you know, and a lot of them are personal memoirs. And you get, you get that, that format of the mission count and get to a home run, et cetera. And there's the great big expansive ones about the whole of the USA Air Force. But we had this conversation as we walked around the perimeter of Ridgewell and thought, actually, our, the unit of currency is the bomb group. And if you want to use a vehicle to get yourself through the narrative of the 8th Air Force history, let's let's follow one group. And the 381st has got a really interesting story to tell. And it's one of the less well-known ones. You know, everyone's going to be up to here with the 100th bomb group by the end of Masters in the Air and know every everyone who's in it and every rivet on every aircraft, but we want to do something different. Well, oh, brilliant. And, and, and yeah. you said, Paul, that you, you kind of did the ground bit and, Mike, you did the air bit. Is that more or less how it worked? That's right, yeah. So, again, I, I kind of uh, had an overall idea of what the 381st was doing on almost a daily basis, and it was a question of how, how does Mike come into this? Um, so we decided that, you know, Mike would look at things from, I've, I've got this joke about Mike being a, an officer in the Army Air Corps and that he's got this helicopter view. And, and that's what he gave to this book. He, he gave it the helicopter view. Because um, I was just, you know, I spent so long uh, learning about these guys that I'm kind of blinkered to, to other things that are going on outside. So, yeah, it worked. When we came together, it, it did work. And I think we were um, really... Very pleased. I think Paul's being very, being very modest there. I mean, he, he doesn't. I, I, I came. I wanted. To, I was really interested in the operational aspects. How do you, how do you form a combat box? How do you get there? How do you, do all the different commanders and all that. And, and you know, it's like when you, when you're out battlefield guiding, you've got that whole different level from tactical, operational, strategic. Mm -hmm. You've got to give it all context. And I kept hitting Paul with the, what's the context of that? Where, where does that fit in? And he, but he was just all over these personal stories, the stuff, the human side of the stuff you really want to know. So. It was a good, that, good Yeah, that's the irony of it. I mean, the, the only reason I ever got involved in this is because 
be working in aviation. I'm a geek when it comes to aeroplanes, and the B-17 was always my favourite. So the only reason I, I learned about the 381st was by reading a book by John Comer, who we'll talk about in a short while. And this led me to learn about the 381st. I never knew anything about I never knew anything about Ridgewell. I had a little bit of information about the 8th, but not too much. And it kind of set me on this journey that has changed me because originally it was about the B-17, and now it's about the guys who flew inside them or so, um, them or the cooks. Tell, or, tell everyone or, where your house is, Paul. Say again? Tell everyone where your house is now. <laughs> My house is about 100 metres from hard stand number 49 at Ridgewood Airfield. So, yeah. <laughs> Geek alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can't claim you didn't feel any kind of connection with the subject. You know, if you literally can walk out and you can be where those aircraft were, you 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 must be there to, to grab that inspiration about a subject. So, um, well, you've come on with a PowerPoint, and I'm glad you know there is a narrative to this because I've read a lot of eight Air Force histories, particularly the ones of crews. You always feel that you've, the story hasn't reached an end. It's reached an end for the individuals, but it's not reached an end for the war because, as you know, you know we know the these people just came and went in sometimes very kind of short space of time. They were only with a unit for you know even week, weeks at a time, and so you're reading it and you're going, "Yeah, but I don't know how this unit began. I don't know how it ended. I don't know what the arc was." But we will find out tonight. So, folks. Um, Paul and Mike have worked out how they're going to do this. Kind of Paul, Paul uh, telling me when to move on the uh, the uh, slides, and we'll do that. And um, yeah. and folks, if you've got questions, far away, and we'll kind of do them kind of as we go, but some at the end. So so over to you guys. Yeah. So if you can go to the next slide for us, Paul, and then I think Mike, you're going to talk about. Yeah, just very briefly. Nothing, nothing to do. Well, it is a bit. It is to do with the three first. Here's a, a U.S. Army Air Corps B-17, one of the early versions, which uh, destroyed or well, looking pretty pretty poorly. In the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, and we, we, when we started to talk about the book, I, I said it's ironic, really, that this this flying fortress, this aircraft, this iconic arm to the teeth bomber that we talk about, they, their first action is on is, is Pearl Harbor Day when they're flying into Hawaii with all their guns stowed, completely unarmed and unaware of an attack. And they, and um, we went through um, through that how how that those that twelve that formation of twelve bombers which had left California at you know, fifteen minute intervals arrived in the middle of a war zone. And just, I just thought that was completely ironic. That how could that happen? You know, how did that happen to them? But even then, surrounded by zero fighters and all this, some of them still got away, still landed it, and it just showed that, and went on to fight in the Pacific Theatre, which we don't really associate much with the uh, with the B seventeen. They, yeah, they are there, but they, they get phased out by generally by the B twenty four Liberator. Mm -hmm. So this, we just do that. We talked about that because that's the start of the war. And introduces the reader to the fortress's debut in the war, which is not really a good one. Brilliant. Moving on. Moving on. Um, can you hear me there, Paul? Yep. Uh, so, as Mike says, I mean, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941, B-17s landed. Um, some of them got destroyed, as we, we've just seen. But they were there to augment the 19th Bomb Group uh, in the Pacific. And the 19th Bomb Group stayed in the Pacific for a year or so and then moved back to the US. And when it moved back to the US, it got moved back to uh, a new army airfield that had been built in the Texan desert. And this place was, was called Pyote. And the 19th Bomb Group had been sent back purely to instruct or bestow its expertise on the new bomb groups that are now coming through. We're, we're at the beginning of 1943. Um, this is really the start of the build-up of the 8th Air Force proper. And because of this burgeoning number of groups that were coming through, the 19th had to come back to the US and, as I say, bestow its expertise. And when it arrived back, it was the highest decorated unit of the US Army at the time. It had, uh, I think, four distinguished unit citations and two medals of honour. Anyway... Uh, the 19th arrived at Pyote um, on the 1st of January 1943. And Pyote had been built across four months beforehand uh, in the Texas desert. And as it was being built, these construction workers were stumbling across these diamondback rattlesnake dens. And as a result of that, Pyote eventually became known as the Rattlesnake Bomber Base. And one of the first groups to arrive there was this newly activated 381st Bomb Group. And it was headed by the man in the centre of this uh, this collage of photographs here, the, 
the hero shot, I like to call this. This is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph J. Nazaro. And he is 29 years old at the time. And, you know, he'd been in the Philippines. He'd flown for a year. He was a West Point graduate, class of 1936. Um, he was a rising football star. He was a good-looking dude, that's for sure. And, yeah, 29 years old. He arrived at Pio on January the 2nd, 1943, to establish the 381st Bomb Group, so the US Army Air Force's newest bomb group. Um, this was the start of two phases of training for the 381st, which took place across the next three months. Um, and this, the group was built up. So originally there were four B-17s assigned to it, and there were four crews to, assigned to each of these B-17s that became known as model crews. So these were the guys that the rest of the crews had to aspire to. These, This was the cream of the crop. Um, so these four crews, four B-17s were the start, and then over the next three months, another 40-odd B-17s were assigned to the group. Many more men arrived, including the chap on the right, James Good Brown. He was the chaplain. And um, from some of your viewers may have heard his name already. I will say probably one of the most amazing guys to be assigned to a bomb group. Um, he was 41 years old when he arrived at Pi Oaks. Um, which is quite old compared to the other guys, especially when you consider the commanding officer was 29 years old. Uh, James Good Brown got himself in trouble right at the start because he left his home in Massachusetts and he arrived at Pio 24 hours after he should have done. And Nazaro was less than happy with this. You know, you're 24 hours late, where have you been? And Chaplain Brown, he explained, well, you know, he got stuck in El Paso. He decided to go sightseeing, so he walked across the Rio Grande into Mexico. He got his camera stolen off him. He ended up in a jailhouse in Mexico. So he's telling this to Nazaro, and Nazaro's eyes are rolling, and he shouted at him. And this was one of the first times that James Good Brown was shouted at, a 41-year-old man. And he had the middle name of Good that his, his parents had given him, um, who, who were both ministers. So... Not a good start for James Good Brown, but this was the start of the 381st. As I say, three months in Pio, they then moved on to a place called Pueblo in Colorado, which was a much nicer training base for the 381st. Um, but Pio, it was, as I say, the rattlesnake bomber base. It was dusty. There were, there were sandstorms, snakes. Um, Pueblo was much more, much, much nicer, more established next to a town. Uh, the crews very much like this. And this is where the third and final phase of training took place. Uh, high altitude formation flying, simulated uh, combat conditions, bombing attacks on, or um, simulated bombing attacks on uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Um, and by the end of May 1943, the group was ready to move overseas. But the crews didn't know where they were going. They didn't know if they were going to the Pacific. They didn't know if they were going to the ETO, the European Theatre of Operations. Uh, Chaplain Brown, he had an inkling when his uh, summer uniform was taken off him at Pueblo. Um, and the, the B-17 crews also had an idea because the Japanese fighter recognition has been dropped from their, um, from their ground forces. Mm. So they, some of them had a, an idea. And it wasn't until Chaplain Brown climbed aboard RMS Queen Elizabeth, the luxury cruise liner that had been... Um, converted into a troop ship at New York's uh, 44th Street Pier, uh, that he realised we're, we're off to Europe. And that was pretty much where the rest of the 381st was going. There were two echelons, ground echelon and air echelon. Air echelon obviously flew across in the B-17s, um, staging first at Gander, Newfoundland, then over the Atlantic, which is no mean feat. You know, there's no ATC, there's no GPS you're reliant on your navigator to get you there. And thankfully, all 41 got across the Atlantic, landed at Presswick, and then they staged to Bovingdon in Hertfordshire, which was the 8th Air Force's acclimatisation base uh, in England. And this is where they were indoctrinated into British flying procedures for 10 days. And meanwhile, the uh, ground crews moved across on the Queen Elizabeth, and it came across unescorted. Uh, it wasn't escorted by any destroyers or frigates. It was it just zigzagged all the way across the Atlantic because it could outrun a U-boat if necessary. 
Uh, it left many of the men sick. There were 14,000 of them on that troop ship. It wasn't a nice place to be. And again, Chaplain Brown writes about this in his, his quite amazing diary that got published after the war um, as the mighty men of the 381st Heroes All. So the 381st is now in England, finally. And it's due to arrive at its new airfields, uh, Ridgewell, on the Essex-Suffolk border. And Paul, if you could go to the next slide for me. And Mike, this is for you to... Yeah, I just think um, before we should talk about Earthfields, just give our, our viewers a metric. It, by that stage of the war, when 381st first arrived in UK in '43, the, the, the US Army Air Force is producing 37,000 pilots a year. So that, just process that number. Obviously, they're going to fight in the Pacific and defend the Aleutian Islands and all a lot of other places. But you know, that's 37,000 pilots a year. And the big thing I always find fascinating is. How do you grow an air force and how is what's their corporate level of knowledge it's you know we talk a lot about landing in normandy or the battle of the somme in 1916 what did what do the guys left and right know of you and how do you influence that it's quite well documented presented in band of brothers the tv series of mm. how, how people are trained what, what the last what the last guys ahead of you told of passing back and that's certainly the case here um choice of the airfields i mean Pre-war and into the early stages of the war in UK, 33% of the UK construction industry was working on airfields, rearmament through to um, it's right through the war. And at one stage, it worked, the uh, the war office is taking over, or the air ministry is receiving an airfield a week uh, for, to be handed over. And the 31st are lucky because they're, they're getting one of the existing concrete runway We've got plenty of facilities uh, air for Ridgewell. Ridgewell have been occupied before. It's on the Essex Suffolk border, as um, as Paul's already explained. You know, and a lot of it's built. The foundations are built on rubble from the east end of London, which has been trucked out and used as foundations from the Blitz, and um, put in, put in as foundations. It's a classic uh, Type A airfield. And if you look at the the photographs, you can see the triangle there, and basically the, the main runway. Is the longest runway that's the primary one and, and the, the survey is done is wind direction because for those who don't fly or you know when you take off and land you you really want to land take to take off into wind to get more lift over your wings in, in basic terms so that the orientation of the, of the main runway is with the prevailing winds coming down so you take off in either direction and the other ones can be used as taxiways or emergency landings or whatever if the wind shifts around and then you've got uh it, it's going to involve civilian contractors building it's like a long time to, it's it's not just the runways, it's the, it's the perimeter track, it's the bunkers for the ammunition, it's the accommodation, it's the medical facilities, the technical zone, the ops rooms. Uh, and, you know, we we have this perception of these airfields being secure. Most of them are completely porous. So the testimony we get from people who, who's, you know, older people these days who are still alive say, I remember that, I remember that, but I used to sit on the perimeter and watch or wander in and get chocolate and chewing gum. And you think, yeah, no way, they wouldn't have got through the fence. There is no fence. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them talk about sitting on tree trunks around Ridgewell where the trees have been felled and just left horizontal and people, young boys and girls, sat on the tree trunks watching it all this go on. So, And the airfield has a, a, a life of its own. Any airfield, and Paul and I spent most of our adult life on airfields, you know, it, there's there's ground runs, there's air tests, there's resupplies. I mean, the amount of fuel that must be being brought in there every day by tanker or every night probably to top it. It's constant, you know, all of the time. So these are complex things to build. And you might think that the bulk of them, as we know, when we talk about you watch um, 12 o'clock high or something like that, the bulk of them are in East Anglia. And that's, you know, that's by choice because it's closer to Germany. And also because it avoids the, the majority of the Bomber Command airfield to the north in Lincolnshire and Bomber County and all that all that area. So when Ira Ica comes over at, right at the start, he says, I'm going to go East Anglia, which is why it, it seems like East Anglia is almost concreted over. And if we were flying at that height over that airfield, we could look left and right and see the next airfields all around us. You know, Paul's literally living on the edge of the airfield there. I, I can walk out my front door and turn right to Mendelsham Airfield up the hill in Suffolk. You know, they're all mm. around us. Uh, 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 Wormingham for Boxted for me when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah exactly. Kid. Very famous Boxted. Yeah, yeah. Very famous mm. airfield. So these, uh, the only point, I mean, it, these are massive construction projects. And then when the US enters the war and they arrive, they bring their own impetus and they've got um, their own engineers enhancing them, improving them. But Ridgewell, because of where it is, 
in its proximity to London, and because it's quite a swanky airfield in relative terms, unlike um, Grafton Underwood or, or Under Mud, as it was called, and all these other places. Um, big VIP visitors, you know, they come to they can be brought to Ridgewell because you can get in and out from London and visit and be and have your photo taken and, and be back. I think that's enough. There's loads more in the book about metrics about how much concrete, how much tarmac, and all that geeky stuff that people want to read. <laughs> so moving on. Yeah. Um, back to the 381st and its arrival at Ridgewell. Uh, Chaplin Brown writes about it quite interestingly in his, in his book about walking past houses with names on every house, not numbers, and names like in storybooks. So he was quite taken with this. But when he got to Ridgewell, one of the first things he did was confiscate, as he put it, the, the base chapel. And he lived in that building for the next two years. And as I say, during that time, he, he wrote this diary got published after the war. And his story really is a thread throughout the book. I mean, he was the all-seeing eye. Um, unfortunately, he spent most of his time at Ridgewell picking up body parts and burying people. Um, uh, that, was, that was the sad reality of what he was having to do at the time. When he arrived, this was uh, early part of June 1943. This was really at the start of the combined bomber offensive between the 8th Air Force and the Royal Air Force. So the, the 381st was arriving right in the thick of things. And one of the first things it had to do was on June the 22nd, 1943, take part in its first combat mission. And that combat mission was, ironically, to attack the Ford Motor Companies and General Motors plants in the city of Antwerp in Belgium. Um, so these guys are all excited. You know, they've been in for five months, uh, six months or so in Pueblo and Pio, they've been training and we're going to sock it to the Germans and we're here and off they went on their first combat mission, uh, along with the 384th bomb group um, from uh, Polbrook, uh, sorry, Kim Bolton. And these two groups, they were both new, both rookie groups, and they were sent really to act as bait. They were there mainly to lure the German Air Force away from a larger attacking force of American bombers that were off to attack in central Germany and this was a baptism of fire for the 381st two B-17s are shot down over Holland uh, with the loss of both crews that's 20 men in total another two B-17s are forced to crash land on their return to to England uh, one uh, a crew member was brought back to Ridgewell killed uh, another one got off the aircraft hysterical so this was a real a real baptism for these men they weren't you know, they just weren't prepared for it. Hmm. Uh, but worse was to follow the following day. And that really centers around the picture in the center of the collage here. Um, June the 23rd, 1943, the group's second day in combat. And it had been tasked with attacking uh, Luftwaffe airfield in France, Bernay Saint Martin. And during the process of the aircraft being prepared for the mission, the officers have gone to the interrogation or the briefing room to be briefed on the mission. So the officers being the pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator. The, uh, the gunners, the enlisted men, they were on the aircraft preparing their guns. On, on board their aircraft, and the aircraft I'm actually talking about is in the photograph in the top left-hand corner there. The very top aircraft there was known as Caroline. So Caroline's being prepared by her gunners, but also on Caroline are... Uh, a number of electricians, there are ordnance personnel, armaments personnel. In total, there are 22 people working on Caroline. And suddenly, 11 o'clock in the morning, it explodes. And 50 seconds later, there's a second explosion that leaves Caroline in this condition on the hard stand. Chaplain Brown was one of the first on the scene, and he writes about in his diary about the largest piece of wreckage that I saw was that engine. Um, but what of the 22 men who were working on board? Uh, they can only identify 10 of them, unfortunately. Uh, there was a, an officer on another aircraft on the adjacent hard stand. He was also killed by flying debris, as was a British civilian building contractor who was cycling past Caroline when it exploded. So 24 people in total on second day of combat missions uh, from Ridgewell is a complete shock to everyone on the base, a complete shock. 
um, shock to the people in the surrounding villages as well. Um, I mean, before the 381st arrived, RAF 90 Squadron was here for five months and 90 Squadron carried out 51 operations. Uh, but there was no effect on the, 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 the local civilians. But this was a huge effect. I mean, the, the local church was damaged. Yeah, a, a huge tragedy. And unfortunately, this is the, the story of the 381st. His book ended by two tragedies. The second one we'll talk about a bit later on. And what was the cause of the, the explosion? Was it a bomb going off? They'd fused the bombs and set them for instantaneous. And they were 300-pound bombs. And whether one was dropped or what, I don't know. But it set off a chain. And subsequently, you know, we can see the, the aftermath here. So as a result, the explosion of Caroline really became the 8th Air Force's deadliest ground accident to occur in England during the Second World War. Terrible, terrible tragedy. And right at the start as well. Um, just quickly to talk about the markings of the B-17. So you can see in the top left-hand picture the 381st in formation over the Essex countryside. This is before, obviously, the explosion of Caroline. And this is before any markings have been applied to the aircraft. People get very confused by this photo because it shows a B-17 in the foreground with the letter L. And this is the, the main uh, indicator of a 381st aircraft is the letter L. Um, but that was before markings were actually applied. This was um, right at the start of the war when the aircraft came across only bearing the letter of that particular aircraft. So we're looking at an aircraft whose letter, aircraft call sign, was the letter L. Mm. In July, the, the 8th Air Force decided with so many bomb groups coming over to America and with so many aircraft in the skies over England forming up, the only way of the crews being able to differentiate where their bomb group was, was by applying these markings, which were taken from the, the cattle ranches, cattle ranch markings. So the 381st, as part of the, as it was then the first bombardment wing of 8th Bomber Command, it was assigned a triangle. This would eventually be the first bomb division of the 8th Air Force. And the letter L, which signified the 381st bomb group. This was in July. So now the 8th Air Force is starting to, you know, we were talking about logistics and how it all came together. It's it's starting to, it's just, it's all starting to come together. This was in July. Not long after that, the 8th was invited to join the RAF in the first battle the RAF's Battle of Hamburg, which became known as Operation Gomorrah. And oddly enough, the first target for the 381st and most of the actual 8th Air Force at the time was were targets in Norway. So the 381st went off to bomb a molybdenum plant in Heroya in Norway. Mal molybdenum in, uh, is being used in the production of, of alloys. So the 381st gone off to Heroya and... Over the target, one of the B-17s is hit by flak, Flieger, Abwehr, Canona, or anti-aircraft fire, and one of the engines is damaged. And this engine is, or the propeller is windmilling, as they called it. And windmilling is not good because it will slow your bomber. It will produce drag. Um, and the only way of stopping that drag is to feather propellers. So you turn the propeller or you rotate it into the, into the oncoming air. So the pilot of George Rebel over the target, he's got this damaged engine. He's rotated the propeller into the uh, into the airflow, but one blade's badly twisted. So this propeller is still windmilling quite violently. And he doesn't know at the time, but one of the other pilots flying alongside also sees fuel draining from one of his wings. So it becomes quite apparent to the pilot, OCV Jones, who's from Atlanta in Georgia, it becomes apparent he's not going to get back to England. There's no way he's going to make it. So he confers with his crew, what are we going to do? You know, we, you know we've got Denmark here, there's Germans there. We've got Sweden there, there's uh, Norway there, there's Germans there. Where are we going to go? We're, we're head for Sweden. So that's what they do. Trouble is, the navigator's got no um, maps of Sweden on him. So he can only guess where where the boundary is, where, where the border is. Luckily, he guesses right because, and also the pilot, O.C. Jones, is forced, his hand is forced because he's losing fuel. And the picture on the right there is actually of Georgia Rebel descending over Sweden. Um, it landed in a boggy field 
uh, just outside this Swedish uh, hamlet of Vanica. And the crew got out, it barely landed, uh, came to a halt just in front of a pole. Crew got out, perfectly uninjured, no problem. A young boy arrived, perfect English, said, you've landed in Sweden. These guys, O.C. Jones and his crew and George Rebel, they became the first American airmen to become interned by the Swedish authorities uh, during the war. Um, when I say interns, they weren't put up in a prison camp. They were actually put up in a rented house in a place called Fallon. So they were quite lucky, those guys. And they would eventually be repatriated back to England the following year as a result of a, an agreement between the Americans and the British, uh, the Americans and the Swedes about having these crews repatriated. So that was Operation Camorra. The 381st took part in six missions um, over that week-long period, and they lost five B-17s and 50 men. So uh, you can already see, you know, these crews, the crews that have come together, come over the Atlantic, they've trained together for five months, and they're gradually, gradually being whittled away. And Chaplin Brown talks about this quite vividly in his book. So could you... Go on to the next slide. Yeah, and just to interrupt, it it, it, yeah. it dovetails nicely with what Luke said yesterday because Luke Truxell was explaining that that kind of summer, July, August period, 43, culminated in kind of the, 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 the big kind of decisions about how to go forward in October, November that changed the structure of the air command. And so, you know, the, the, this bomb group were arriving just as things are already peaking in terms of of, of, of losses and, and, and it not working very well. So it, it couldn't really have been a worse time to arrive. So, so you're telling the story from this individual cruise and individual loss of, in, uh, of, of personnel, but it, it, it connects very well with this broader picture of the 8th Air Force's um, um, steep learning curve. Absolutely, absolutely. But Mike, so uh, yeah, it's just very briefly, just about the composition of a, of a bomb group. I mean, the, so the book is about the bomb group. I called it the unit of currency earlier. And, and it, it, you know, in British terms, it's probably a wing, but it's, it's a collection of squadrons, uh, three squadrons plus a fourth uh, logistic and, and support squadron. And when the war starts, um, you know, bear in mind that December 41, the US only has 154 B-17 flying fortresses in existence. That's it. And... Um, you know, a, a standard bomb group at the start of the war is, is deemed to be 35 aircraft. And three of those aircraft will be what they call staff aircraft for uh, assembly ships, COs to fly around, that kind of thing. Uh, so not, not combat ready aircraft. And the remainder will be split across the squadron. Obviously, there's going to be some in maintenance. So the standard unit for a squadron at the time is eight, eight B-17s or eight Liberators, however you want to play it. But um, that, and bomb groups wise, when we get to uh, the December of uh, 43 and going forward, um, the US Army Air Force will have over 200 bomb groups, uh, sorry, 200 groups, fighters, ground attack, light bombers, except medium bombers and, and all different types. But by far the biggest component of that will be, a, when, it, when it's a peak strength, 104 heavy bomber groups of three squadrons each, and they will have uh, 14 aircraft per squadron. Uh, and then a few others. So you, you can see, I said, how do you grow an army? At the start, at the start of the um, start of the war, the, the U.S. Army Air Force has three hundred and forty-five thousand people in it, which is it's a staggering number in itself mm. right across all those theaters. But it's going to be it's going to grow to two million wow. ultimately. Uh, you know, and and all of this is back to that doctrine that the bomber will always get through, and this this almost evangelical belief in daylight precision bombing from the Americans. They invest so heavily in, in this and the troops. So the whole purpose of a bomb group is, Paul mentioned earlier, the RAF being on stage. Normally, you know, the an RAF station would have two squadrons on it, uh, but the Americans do organise themselves differently. And everything's built around that, the number of hangars, the number of uh, the accommodation, you know, and, and it's, you know, roughly over 2,000 people per, per airfield. So you imagine the little villages around Ridgewell, which are a few dozen people in some cases, hamlets, or 500 in the main village, and then 2,000 complete strangers literally drop out of the sky and move into your into your locale and take over, drink all your beer, chase all the girls, do all the things they're going to do, and then you've got these bombers exploding on the runway, etc. But but really, I'm always quite staggered with Paul quite rightly highlighted the role of Joe Navarro because he's only 29. Mm. Lieutenant Colonel at 29, 
with the responsibility of you know 35 B-17s and crews, plus all the support elements, plus all the operations, plus all the logistics support and the decision making that goes with that. Um, it, it's a huge effort. But um, in that picture, which you can see on the slide, here, you know, that's a great picture we used for the book cover as well, because it just shows all the different types of people that are going to be involved in it. And and also, they're all equipped. They've all got sunglasses. They've all got nice uniforms, all this kit. It, that's a huge economic effort to to fit the, train these guys in the first place. I mentioned the 37,000. And then the ground crew and air specialists, like your rear, your gunners, etc. they're training another 112,000 a year. So mm. they're staggering numbers that they could, from a, from a standing start being, not start till 1941 really properly going for it. Uh, it's it's amazing how they get to that point where Paul mentioned where the 381st arrive at the peak of the air war and do that. And uh, the 381st will stand out as one of the best bomb groups of the US uh, 8th Air Force. And we talk about formations later, and that's down to those formative experiences in, in the US mm -hmm. before they cross the Atlantic. They, they train really hard. And it, and it proves the point that with that amount of personnel, there's no way this whole plan of daylight bombing is going to be given up. Too much has been put into it. Too many people have been involved in it. There's too many aircraft. It's just going to have to persevere until it's over the humps of how, of how to make it work. There's no way. It's not like a tank design that's going to be abandoned because it's crap. This is just going to keep on working until it improves. And that's really the, the story for the 8th Air Force, isn't it? Just keep on doing it, change the personnel, change the tactics, it change the doctrine, improve everything, and eventually it'll find its 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 um, its um way of doing things, which is 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 the, the big narrative, isn't it? Beyond that of an individual bomb crew. But we'll... You're absolutely right. And, you know, and there'll be the... Obviously, Paul's already mentioned, introduced the Luftwaffe. They, they get a vote in all of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they have a vote in this. We are trying to bomb the homeland and occupied territory, the weather, uh, you know, and you've got... You know, Bomber Harris people, they're massively behind the Americans, but they want the 8th Air Force under command and the 9th Air Force. We, we must mention the 9th as well. Mm. And uh, they want them to join them and, and follow their plan. So, and it's, I mentioned the evangelical, and there's, there is that British way, code of bombing, and there's the, the US way. And Nord, we, you've, also, you've also invested in the Northern bomb site. Mm. You know, after the Philadelphia project, they had to bomb the most expensive and highly classified piece of equipment in in US service, uh, and, and they'll never fit them on one in every aircraft because they're so expensive. They're guarded going to and from the aircraft, they've got self destruct switching them, and all it's just amazing when you look at it. And it's just such a different war, uh, to, to RF Bomber Command, which is a completely different uh, war that they're going through. Yeah, definitely. Well, moving on, moving on. Um, so we have on the left uh, a chap called Leonard Spivey who was a farmer's son from New Mexico. And he joined with the 381st at Pio, and he was made navigator of the 535th Bomb Squadron's uh, model crew. So he was, you know, well respected. When he arrived at Ridgewell, he was made the 535th Bomb Squadron's lead navigator. So that meant to say he was in charge of all the other navigators in that particular squadron. But then he experienced another rise to become the standing group navigator. So now he's got everyone underneath him, every other navigator. And at the beginning of August, he joins Joe Nazaro on a trip across London to a place called Pine Tree. It's the code name for 8th Bomber Command's headquarters, uh, Wickham Abbey School for Girls. So Spivey can't believe this. You know, he's 22 years old. He's a second lieutenant, um, a farmer's son from um, New Mexico, and here he is rubbing shoulders with, with the big boys of the 8th Air Force. You know, he's introduced to Ira Acre. Um, Spivey talks about uh, the ante room, the hats being lined up on the table, gold braid everywhere. He couldn't believe couldn't believe where he was. And he, he talks about it being the most fascinating experience of the Second World War for him, which is quite amazing because literally about eight weeks later, he was shot down over Holland. But that's, that's another story. While he was at Pine Tree, the whole reason for his being there was to be told about the mission to Schweinfurt. And this has gone down in history now as, as the infamous Schweinfurt Ravensburg raid of August 17th, 1943. So Spivey's at Pine Tree. He's with Jonas Arrow, the commanding officers of the other bomb squadrons at Ridgewell. And 
the great and the good of the Eighth Air Force. And then before them is this small model of Schweinfurt, this mock-up of the town of Schweinfurt. And Spivey's looking at this model and he's counting the flat gun positions all around Schweinfurt. And he counted something like 80 flat guns. So he wasn't particularly impressed by this because he didn't like flak, obviously. And then he was approached by an RAF officer who informed him, you know, we're going to go in at 15,000 feet. And what do you think about that? And he said, well, we're going to be a much bigger target, aren't we? So this was the start of the planning for Schweinfurt. And as we know, the 8th Air Force is a strategic bombing force. It's raison d'etre is to carry out attacks on areas that are key to the economy of the enemy. So places like oil refineries and aircraft factories, but also oil bearing factories, which we really think about as being that important, but it's a key ingredient in the production of tanks and aircraft. So Spivey knows about this mission, but the rest of the 381st guys don't. He's told, you know, because you're going, because you know the plans, you're not allowed to go on any other missions. But he did go on other missions, which made me laugh. August 17th, 1943, the day of Schweinfurt. It was a double strike mission. Um, the 381st and other first, first bomb division groups were going to go off to Schweinfurt to attack the ball bearing factories there. Another force of bombers was going off to Regensburg, also in central Germany, to attack a Messerschmitt plant there. And this double strike mission, the, the Regensburg force would go first, it would fight its way into Regensburg, it would bomb, and then it would swing south to go and land in North Africa. The crews would rest, the aircraft would rearm, refuel, and then they'd fly back to their bases the following day, bombing Germany on the way back. So they would fight their way in. The Schweinfurt force would follow behind and largely be protected from the Luftwaffe before bombing Schweinfurt and then heading back to England to fight its way back out. Well, unfortunately, things went very badly wrong from the outset, and it was all to do with what many of the 8th Air Force men considered the second worst enemy, which was the weather. And it was the British weather as well on this occasion, because the Schweinfurt force was stuck to the ground because of fog over the bases. The Regensburg force had been trained to take off using instruments. So, you know, and there was, you know, there was a shrinking daylight window in which to land in North Africa. So they had no choice. They had to go. So off they went to Regensburg. And it wasn't until four hours later, or almost four hours later, that the Schweinfurt force began moving out from their house stands at places like Ridgewell. And that was the number of the double strike plan has gone completely out of the window. Um, and that was where it all went badly wrong from the start. Because by the time the group arrived over Schweinfurt, it had already lost eight B-17s on the way in. Another three were lost on their way back. Um, so 11 B-17s lost out of a, a formation of 26. So only 15 made it back to Ridgewell. Um, Leonard Spivey, he was the lead navigator on the five, uh, for the 535th Bomb Squadron. He actually talked quite candidly about, you know, he, he managed to avoid the flak over Schweinfurt and the fighters going in. Um, but he didn't even need to navigate on the way back home. He said we could just follow the plumes of smoke all the way back to England. So that was quite a, a, quite a vivid uh, description that he, he came across with. Um, so, yeah, the Schweinfurt raid, uh, an absolute disaster for the 8th Air Force as a whole, but a complete disaster for the 381st. 11 B-17s lost, 110 men lost in action. James Good Brown, you know, again, talks vividly about going back to the huts that the other crews shared with the crews who'd gone missing. And realizing, you know, there were 100 empty beds here, 110 empty beds. And at breakfast the next morning, half empty breakfast hall, mess halls, just a terrible, terrible, uh, terrible thing for the group. The only high point involved the guy in the center of this collage on the right hand side here. This is Robert E. Nelson. Um, and Robert E. Nelson was a co pilot of King Malfunction 2. That was the name of the bomber. And King Malfunction 2 was shot down over Germany. Most of the crew managed to get, get out before it crashed. Rob, uh, Jack Payne to the pilot, he couldn't. He was killed in action. But Robert E. Nelson and Raymond Gens, one of the waste gunners, they managed to get out, and they had a remarkable journey because they reputedly became the first American airmen to successfully escape and evade capture after bailing out over Germany. It took them two months to get back to Ridgewell. 
I can see Robert E. Nelson here being presented with the Silver Star, which is America's third highest honour for valour. And he would eventually, him and Raymond Gens would eventually go on to lecture other 8th Air Force crews in escape and evasion techniques. So a bit of a hero um, was Robert E. Nelson. The guy next to him was on the same mission, uh, August 17th, 1943. Some of your viewers may recognise this guy because he wrote a, quite a remarkable book called Combat Crew. And this is John Comer. He was an engineer in a top turret gunner with the 381st. He was a replacement. So he arrived in July 1943. And, you know, this, as you said earlier, Paul, this was the height of, of what was going wrong. Yep. This was the height of crews going missing. And he's turned up at the wrong time. Um, and he spent a lot of his time calculating his chances of survival which at this particular moment, he had a 75% chance of not going back home. Um, his first night at Ridgewell, he was unpacking his clothes, veteran gunners burst in, you know, oh, we've got a new guy here. Where are you from? What size shirt are you wearing? And he's, you know, what do you want to know about the size of my shirt? Oh, well, you know, they don't give you any new clothes here. You know, when, when a gunner your size goes down, we, we make sure we know where your clothes are going to be so we can have them off your back. And that's pretty much the kind of thing you were met with when you joined at this particular time uh, in the 8th Air Force's history. So it's thanks to John Comer that really I know about the 381st because it was only by luck that I picked up his book. And I do recommend anyone who would like to know more about the 8th Air Force, they read up on, on, on Combat Crew because it is a fantastic book. But we move on to the next slide. And Mike, maybe you want to... Explain about yeah, yeah. I, I just like to echo what, what Paul just said about combat crew. I mean, obviously, you're going to it's better to buy our book if you want to know about a bomb group, but the link in the description below, as always, you can buy bomb group at all your local bookshops or online. It's available to order pre order. It's not actually in the shops yet, is it? It's soon, it's out, it's out. <laughs> so, but I was what I was going to say, I was, I was joking, and what I was going to say is Comer's book as a personal memoir is probably the, the best, I, I think. There are a number of very good ones out of it. It's particularly good. So here we are looking at this picture of a, a B-17C or a Fortress Mark I, uh, because this is in our Royal Air Force colours. And this is, um, Paul mentioned earlier, 90 Squadron Royal Air Force, who were in the desperate days after the Battle of Britain when uh, UK was struggling wanted more air cover. of course again to use that phrase moot point we were never alone but when, when things were against us um you know we were grabbing any any aircraft we could get and we managed to get a squadron's worth of of Boeing b-17 c marks which the americans themselves said weren't ready yet they weren't really the finished product uh but we were just so desperate for a long-range bombers and something that could fly this high and we tend to think of the the b-17 as those chrome plated we talk, we, most people look at the airfix kit cover of a G model with the uh, bit of lace with the, the half-naked woman on the side with the chin turret and all the guns. The B-17 is a long evolution before that point. You know, we're talking, that's the G model. We're looking at the C, and of course, it's going to be a D, E, and an F that goes in. And before we get to the final, it's a remarkable airframe in that it develops basically the airframe, apart from the changes to the tail and the nose, the basic core of the airframe stays the same. And part of that, I think it's fair to say, is due to the uh, experience of 90 Squadron RAF, who, who, who used them in penny packets on high altitude missions in daylight over Germany. They try them at night as well, but uh, and they have all kinds of problems. And all the problems that come home to roost, because the B-17, designed and built in Seattle, trialled in the, over Arizona and Nevada and all these places, is, has not really been tested in European weather and at that altitude against a hostile enemy. So a lot of the problems with the weapon systems, with the navigation, with how to prepare the weapons with the cold, that, 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 uh, that altitude, all come home to roost. And the RAF compile and compile and can collate all of this information and are passing it back to, the, to, to Boeing all of the time. So although we don't take it on as a bomber because it's not successful, we keep it for coastal command and we get the Fortress 2, which is ironically what the B-17 was originally designed to do, to be a maritime aircraft, a maritime strike aircraft. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a very different thing to, to what we see in the 381st in 1943 to what we see at the start. And, and we need to go right back to 1934. 
you know, we t- tend to think of the, of the B-17, 42, 43, 44. That's the punching its way through to Germany, as Paul's just described. But actually, it goes back along. And it is a huge gamble by Boeing to design and build this thing. They invest half a million dollars, which is a lot of money at the time, to, to field these things. And the, the U.S. Army Air Corps are so impressed, they order 13 of them for trials. And this thing can fly higher, faster than any, any other aircraft around it. And 15 tons all up weight. And it's a, it's the Seattle newspaper reporter who, who coins the phrase, Mike, this is, my God, it's a 15-ton flying fortress. And at that stage, it's nowhere near the fortress it's going to be. It hasn't got like half as many guns as it's going to have, but all the armor plating, all the self-sealing fuel tanks and all the, all the things that will come along the way. Uh, and certainly, you wouldn't recognize that one in the picture. You can just about recognize the the essence of a B-17 there, but it's not what we recognize when we talk about the 381st. So it's a remarkable aircraft, and um, we'll talk about formation and combat boxes. It, it's ideal for what it does, and it's a bit like the Apache that I used to work on. If it, if it, most designs that fly, if it looks right, it is right. And the B-17, to me, looks right, like a Spitfire or a P-51, they, it looks right. Well, Paul will talk to you now about um, actually the um, them in, in service. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you've got a B-17 there in the top left-hand corner that doesn't look right. <laughs> uh, there's a good reason for that, uh, because that has just come back from Bremen on uh, October the 8th, 1943, which is a particularly bad mission for the 8th Air Force as a whole, but also mainly for the 381st, because it was on this mission that the group lost seven B-17s. Um, but also this one got back to Ridgewell quite miraculously. And this was the B-17 that earned the 381st its first distinguished service cross. And that was for the co-pilot of this aircraft, uh, Thomas Sellers. So over, Ger- over Germany, the aircraft attacked by uh, the Luftwaffe. Um, the guys there on the top of the aircraft are pointing to bullet holes in the windscreen. Basically, the pilot was decapitated. And Thomas Sellers' co-pilot was forced to fly this aircraft back to Ridgewell in this condition. Um, wounded himself, and as I say, it was it resulted in him being awarded the first of two distinguished service crosses for the 381st. It was also the first distinguished unit citation that the group received, the first of two, and that was on October the 8th. But this period in October 1943 was a, a terrible period for the 8th Air Force and for the 381st. I mean, we are taking significant losses here. So much so that on October the 8th, you had your first uh, commanding officer of one of the bomb squadrons shot down over the target. The following day, October the 9th, after a mission to Anklam, which is in a very far northeastern corner of, of Germany, um, another commanding officer of one of the other bomb squadrons has been killed in action. This is Landon Hendricks, the guy who's pictured on the right here. Landon Hendricks actually flew Tinker Toy across the Atlantic, uh, but he was killed... Uh, on the way back from Anklam on October the 9th, his aircraft was badly damaged by fighters and it eventually crashed into the North Sea with the loss of the entire crew. So for the 381st, you've got two commanding officers lost in the space of 24 hours. Uh, again, another big shot for everyone in the group. Five days later, October the 14th, 1943, we've just observed the anniversary of this. Mm-hmm. This was the second Schweinfurt raid. And... The 381st was really lucky on this day. Um, lucky because the weather actually helped on this occasion. Um, during the takeoff, uh, the group found the cloud conditions much higher than expected. So it took them much longer to, to break free of the clouds and into the, the clear skies. But when they finally broke three, free, they were, they were widely scattered. So it took them a long time to get back in formation. Then it took them a long time to to locate the rest of the division, which was at Cromer, just on the, on the coast of Norfolk. Um, and then when they found the formation, they found that their position, the 381st position, has already been taken by the 305th bomb group. Um, uh, the 305th was also lost, but it found this empty slot in the formation, so it took it up, the 381st position. 381st had to fly further up into towards the 91st bomb group. And this was a stroke of luck for the 381st because over Schweinfurt um, on the bomb run, the 305th had already lost 12 of the 15 B-17s that it had sent. And by comparison, the 381st only lost one. 
So the second Triumph Hurt Raid, which everyone now knows as Black Thursday, uh, mm -hmm. wasn't so black for the 381st. But again, Triumph Hurt, the place that no one knew about before, but everyone now knows is a complete swear word. Um, unfortunately, the 381st would have to go back to six times after this. Mm. So we will move on uh, to talk about the cruise and making a home run on us, Mike. Yeah, I just what Paul was just talking about, I think, is, is important because you know we we talked about and, and Paul, you said the intro right at the start about this this narrative of the Eighth Air Force being wholly successful all the time and punching its way through as it did with all those all those guns, etc. But there are numerous points in the in the daylight precision bombing campaign where there are wobbles and the casualty rate is just so high and you wonder is it sustainable when you're losing 12 out of 15 aircraft? I mean, that's 10 men per aircraft. You know, you might be churning out 37,000 pilots a year, but you've still got to get them to this operational level, to this capability. And and morale going back to an airfield and then going back to the mess and having a beer or seeing Chapman, the chaplain or whatever, you're thinking, 120 guys gone today. Just And they might be escaping, evading or whatever. They're not here. And tomorrow you've got to go out and do it again. And, you know, we, we, we need to look at the other side of the coin as well because the Germans are doing the same thing. They're taking the same losses. And, you know, everyone talks about attrition in the ground context but this is an attritional battle in the air for both sides with you know and and there's lots of times with the, the you know the RAF bomber come and say why don't you switch to night bombing guys come and join us it's a, it's a lot safer and you know daylight precision bombing the northern bomb site the combat box the B-17 the B-24 that's what this is the whole thing's designed to be about and that's all right back to America's perception after the great war that you know, carpet bombing is not the way. Is not a, a good way to fight a war, and the U.S. public will not fund bomber aircraft unless they are precision capable in the Northern bomb site, and we can take things out with precision and not to make unnecessary casualties. But it just becomes more and more difficult to do that when you're in the skies of over occupied France or Northern Germany. You, you're really going to be given a hiding. And at what point do you say this isn't working? You know, and a, and a lot of the senior American officers go off on and fly with the RAF at night to see how it works and what it is, and they're, they're still less comfortable. And we mentioned Schweinfurt. Why do they keep going back to Schweinfurt? It's those ball bearings. You need a bump. It's the transport plan, or it's the factory plan, or it's the it's the the oil plan. And actually, twenty twenty hindsight, the, the Americans were probably right in what they were doing, more, but uh, rather than just carpet bombing cities, but. That's a different discussion because you know, the RAF didn't have a choice from 1939 onwards. Yeah. But you know, if you're if you're taking part in this campaign, and we've already mentioned Coma and James Good Brown and all these people and, and, and all those other memoirs you read, you know, your 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 mission is to survive 25 missions at the start to get to the end because then you can go home or go and get a tour as an instructor. And although you say 25 combat missions and they had to be combat missions, you couldn't if it was aborted, it didn't count. Uh, but you could also be killed in crashes, as the Caroline explosion proves. You could be killed on the ground. You know, it, it's um, it's hazardous environment. And the reality rapidly dawns on their guys when they start arriving fresh out of the training system to get here. That I need to get what are the odds? And Comer's book's very good where he's calculating percentages. As, as, and as the, as the more missions you do, rather like Afghanistan in this century, the more missions you do, the more times you go there, the, 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 your odds of survival or being coming away unscathed reduce. Mm. So although you've got less missions to do, the odds of you being killed or wounded are increasing all the time. Mm. So, you know, there's lots of instances of people being shot down on their last mission or crashing or, or whatever. So uh, so making a home run is, is important. Um, and at the start, it, they're trying to grow this Air Force and expand it into 42 and into 43. And even later, um, because of the attrition rates, the, the decision is made to move the goalposts, the 30 and then 35 missions with the target because we're losing them. Less people will, will get with the P-51. People can fly more. We're not going to lose so many guys. We also need to expand and create these extra bomb groups. So it's not a popular decision, particularly when Doolittle comes along and he says, it's 30. Oh, no, it's 35. Mm. And you're thinking, okay, there's less fucker Wolf 190s and 109s around, but it, things are still hazardous out there and um, I want to survive. So um, this is um, William Butler. And he's, he's just completed his 25 missions and there's a quite a, relief, a relief look on his face. Uh, but it's interesting when you read all the memoirs, some of these guys who've done it, they, they then feel left out. 
when everyone else takes off on the next mission, they're still there waiting to go home or whatever. It's most of some of them, some of them come back. So I'll do another tour. Yeah. You know, or um, I've just read um, Serenade to the Big Bird, where Bert Styles does all his missions and then goes off to be a, a fighter pilot and then gets shot down as a fighter pilot. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 a big deal. The the mission count really is a big deal. And, that, yeah, at, at this time we're talking October. This is the highest losses that the eighth is 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 experiencing at the time, and so immediately after that, the eighth Air Force bosses, the, the crews get to hear, oh, you know, we're gonna the next missions are gonna be at a higher altitude. They're gonna be closer range, so you're gonna be escorted all the way. So crews were quite happy with this, but the 381st these guys are still worried you know no one yet has managed to reach this magic 25 mission mark during uh, november 1943 things came into the 8th air force and the 381st that that actually did help to some extent one was this pathfinder force it was the 482nd bomb group at Alconbury. um they were equipped with these new bombers with these radars on board and we have an example of one of the B-17s that the 381st used. This is Sunkist Special. And in place of the ball turret, you've got this radar uh, underneath that could differentiate between land and sea. So it was used mainly on missions to, to coastlines and, and such, such like. But again, it was still some time before someone reached this 25 mission mark. Which, well, it wasn't until November the 5th. That the first guy did that and this was a this was a big thing for everyone you know we could actually do this you know we're going to get through it um it was around this time as well that the the command of the 381st changed so nazaro he'd done his year he'd established the group he'd taken it through the worst losses he was destined for bigger things he was taken off to the u.s strategic air forces in europe he would help command both the eighth air force and the um 15th air force in Italy, and he was replaced by Harry Lieber, who's pictured here on the right. And this was towards the end of December 1943. But his arrival coincided with the first major accident at Ridgewell, and it involved this aircraft in the middle, being flown by Cecil Claw uh, from Indiana. And most of Cecil Claw's crew were on their final missions. Um, Cecil Claw himself was on his 25th and final mission. The aircraft they were flying it was two weeks uh, been assigned to the 381st two weeks before and for whatever reason it took off it lost airspeed lost altitude it clipped the edge of a copse of trees plowed into the ground and exploded killing all 10 men on board um so a tragedy uh, another tragedy yet another tragedy and uh chaplain brown found himself burying more men uh, this time at maddingly which had recently opened maddingly near cambridge um, but again, he, he buried 188 people during his time in England, so many more to come. Can we move on to the next slide, Paul? Yep. Thank you. And we talk so, about um, yeah, when you talk about where these crews came from, and, and it's interesting because I referenced the Somme earlier, and you, you talk about PALS battalions and the Somme or, or some of the formations that came into, into Normandy and into, across Northwest Europe where they were all recruited, etc. And these B-17 crews, are when you when you're dragging in so many people from across American society, you get all kinds of different people from different ed educational backgrounds and different states, et cetera. And that's what you find when you read all of these memoirs. It, it's it's my crew against the world, those 10 guys, you know, and, um, you know, ball, ball turret gunners are a certain kind of person and tail gunners are a certain kind of person and all this kind of thing. And pilots and co-pilots don't, don't get on or, or do get on. And, and, and it is literally all of you against the world. They're going to work as a crew. And they go through a training system. They don't meet up as a crew until quite late on. You know, the gunners are enlisted men. So essentially, if you look at a, a B-17 side on, in the nose of the officers, and also when they when they load up generally, they climb aboard the aircraft. You know, you, you pilot, co-pilot, navigator, engineer, uh, they're, uh, they're officers. And behind that, you, your waist gunners, as you can see in the picture, your ball turret gunner and your tail gunner, and your mid-upper turret gunner, the uh, engineer, they're all enlisted men. And uh, it is remarkable that Behind the, the pilot's average age in the, in the front nose of the aircraft, the average age is 22, 23, maybe younger, but generally 22, 23, generally better educated, generally college boys, etc. all volunteers who've gone through the, the flying training scheme. And then your gunner's average age, 19, which is staggering when you think about it. It really is to, to be at that altitude where you, 
even if you've got a little bit of condensation or sweat in your boots, it's going to freeze and give you a frostbite, etc., and all, all those other hazards, mm-hmm. and you've been thrown into that environment. Um, and it, it's quite an amazing comp- crew composition. We talk about uh, crew resource management and co- crew co- co- uh, composition, how that works. It really is critical. It's all down to the leader because the guy who's in charge is the captain, the pilot. He's in charge of these 10 people. Life and death. The old man. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I mean, just at the end of uh, 43, they did a, a report came out and it, it's, it suggested that one in four, only one in four men were achieving this 25 mission mark. Um, but most of these guys were being lost in their first five missions of their 25 mission tour. And right at the beginning, it was the guys at either end of the aircraft who were suffering the greatest casualties. So the yeah. bombardier and the navigator in the nose, and the tail gunner at the back, basically because the Luftwaffe had figured out, you know, the weakest spot on a B-17 is to attack it from head on. You've got fewest guns trained on you. So, yeah, I mean, I think in any position on the B-17, it wasn't nice. But if you're at either end at this particular time in the war, you, you were, you were going to be a casualty. But if we move on, Paul, to the next slide. Um, We're coming up here, we're in January now, 1944. And on the 11th of January, the 8th Air Force, or the 381st attacks Oschersleben, an aircraft factory in uh, in Germany. And on that mission, the entire formation, the entire crew complement of that formation were replacements. So the original crews were gone. They'd either if they were lucky to survive, had gone back to the States or they'd been killed in action or taken prisoner. So the entire formation was made up of replacements. And one of them was a chap called John Howland, who's pictured in the top left-hand side here. He's second from the left in front row. And these guys on this picture is actually really interesting. They just arrived back from Schweinfurt. This was on the third Schweinfurt mission and the crews all got back. They got given donuts. So these guys were actually chomping through donuts as they're being photographed here. But he flew on this mission to Oschersleben, which, again, was another disaster for the 8th Air Force. And it all stemmed from a recall message that was given halfway across the North Sea. First, second and third bomb divisions have all gone off to Germany. And the second and third bomb divisions are told, you know, you've got to come back because the weather's not good enough. For some reason, the first bombardment division didn't hear this and they continued on, uh, unescorted. Um, and basically down on strength by 80%. And, yeah, it was a, you know, they lost eight B-17s to the 381st on that particular mission. Um, the gunners, I mean, they did have a field day, but they were being shot at while they were doing so. They shot down 28 fighters, and that, that earned the group its second distinguished unit citation. But it was another disaster, and it was something that everyone was, was very angry about. Chaplain Mound talks about, the eighth air force fouling up you know what, what, what's gone wrong here why have they done this why are they trying to get rid of us it was a complete disaster things would eventually get better though uh, so we got into february um and we're, we're coming closer now to france we've been attacking germany we're coming france uh, the luftwaffe airfields in france are coming under attack by the eighth air force really all in preparation for what's coming in operation overlord um, and on one of those missions to Nancy, uh, uh, one of the airfields in Nancy, uh, t- uh, an aircraft called Touch the Button Nil was uh, hit by flak and damaged by fighters as well, and it caught fire. And the three officers, three of the officers in the front of the aircraft, they all bailed out. Co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier, they all went. The pilot went to go, but he couldn't because his, his parachute was on fire. The top turret gunner, he was fighting the fire, and eventually he put it out. The aircraft got back to England. It crash landed at Dunkerswell in Devon. And we have a picture on the right hand side there of Lifford French, who's standing beside the bed of Herbert Burgasser, who was the ball turret gunner. He lost an eye. Um, but Lifford French was the one who fought the fire. He put the fire out and then he sat with the pilot on the way back to England and helped him uh, land the bomber. And he was awarded the group's second distinguished service cross for his work that day, Uh, an amazing man. In the centre of the photo there was uh, about eight days later, it was a a new B-17 that was assigned to the group. And at the time, you know, this was quite interesting. This was part of what was known as the Bermondsey War Loan Fleet. 
So this aircraft was christened rather high as revenge um, because the Bermondsey War Loan Fleet was bought with money that was donated by the residents of the Blitz London Borough of Bermondsey. So one of four bombers, it would survive the war. Quite a remarkable aircraft. It had a lot of missions to its name. Unlike one of its other uh, brothers, the Bermondsey Battler, which was shot down about eight days after this christening ceremony. So not so good for that one. But can we move on to the next um, yep. slide, please? Thank you. And now we talk about the weather. Yeah, for British, we have to talk about the weather at some point, don't we? So, uh, <laughs> so you know, we mentioned earlier about training in, in the States and how, how high altitude precision bombing, you need good clear conditions. You, you know, Early in the war, you definitely need to be able to see the ground so you can use your northern bomb site. Uh, and um, it, you need good weather to take off, good weather, in, not necessarily in transit, but to, to build a formation, you need really good weather conditions and visibility, critically. To get to the target and then to hit the target, you need good weather. Now, all of that is forms a, is a it's a variable that's considered in the American doctrine, but it's not really they've not really experienced bad weather until they get to UK. So once they're in England, and and then you get that issue of and Paul's touched on it with the Regensburg Schweinfurt problems, where if you launch, what's the weather like at the target? Can you hit the target? Can you see the target to hit the target? What's the weather like when you come back? And then one of the great great examples is Christmas Eve. 44, when, when the, the, the Eighth Air Force launches a massive operation to relieve the beleaguered American forces in the Ardennes. And when they turn around to come back, having lost General Castle and all the other things that happened on that raid, nearly all of the airfields are clagged in and no one can see the ground. So bombers are landing at Ridgewell and at, um, just on the road from me here as well, uh, all, where there are airfields that are open, Ruffham Airfield, Bury St Edmunds. Uh, that are open, but so and so many hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of these American air crews that survive and get back, spend their night freezing in on Christmas Eve night on the runways of all these airfields, which are only built to hold so many. So, if if you can see the if you can see the ground and it's good, clear, crystal blue flying conditions, then that's great. But you're leaving a contrail. So the German fighters never struggle to find these combat boxes, these masses of, of flying fortresses, because they're leaving these nice, neat white lines behind them in the, in the sky. They're easy to find and to attack. So the weather is a massive prospect, uh, problem or factor. And the good, the good thing is, though, we have better weather eyes than the Germans because the Germans are penned back into Europe, as we know from Normandy landings, etc. We've got weather stations out in Iceland, on the, in, in North America, and all over the place. So we can build a much more accurate picture and get that down to the respective bomb groups before they set off. But it's still a big factor and certainly many of the accidents we talk about are on formation before they leave the English coast coastline. There's a lot of accidents caused by poor visibility, especially when landing. I think that's enough on the weather, isn't it? I think. Uh, but... Yeah, well, it's, it's quite interesting, actually, because if we go on to the next slide, we go into February yeah. 1944, and this is Big Week. And Big yeah. Week came about, as we know, Big Week came about because the weather over Central Europe was completely clear. And this allowed the 8th Air Force to go off and bomb um, aircraft factories and to lure the Luftwaffe into the air. Um, so, again, the 8th, the 8th Air Force, the heavy bomber boys, they were being used as bait. You know, bring, bring, the 8th, bring the Luftwaffe up into the air. The fighters can go off and shoot them down. And we can whittle the, the Luftwaffe down. We can destroy its ability to, to make any replacements. And by doing that, we achieve air superiority and bring on o uh, Overlord. Um, and D-Day. So big week, uh, the 381st uh, takes part in five missions. It loses six B-17s. Uh, one of them is the aircraft on the left here, which was Friday the 13th. I, I highlight that because we'll talk later on about um, one of the crew of this aircraft who actually came back to Ridgewell post-war. Um, not long after, because of this attrition of the Luftwaffe, uh, the US Army Air Forces realized actually we do we need camouflage? We don't we don't really need camouflage. So they started to feed aircraft out of the factories without any um uh olive drab camouflage. And one of the first to arrive at Ridgewell was Dream Baby, the picture in the center there. This arrived during Big Week, actually, on the last day of Big Week. And you can see there it's not the natural metal finish. It is painted olive drab. And the reason for that is George Shackley, who was the commanding officer of the 533rd Bomb Squadron at the time, he loved the look of the plane, but he didn't like the fact he didn't have any camouflage. And it was 
stand out from the rest of the group. So he had it painted olive drab, which seems a bit strange, but Dream Baby was the first uh, aircraft to arrive at Ridgewell. Sporting it's snap interesting to point, just to point out those two photographs we've got there, one of the chaplain on the right and and the one in the centre. You, you can see it's the, their G models, they've got the chin turret. Yep. Mm. It's a, yeah. a huge difference. To, the, this, Paul talked about this head-on attack that the Luftwaffe like specialised in 12, 13, 14, 15 air, fuck wolves in, in a line yeah. coming head-on. So you, it's remotely operated from the, from the nose, but you've now got two fifty calibers firing straight forward because if you look in the centre photograph, the gun on the left is to go. They don't actually, the guns they've got for the navigator and the... Uh, a bomb aimer to use that they don't fire straight ahead they fire out at an angle because they can't fire straight ahead and they'll try all kinds of different things to do that and they come up with this this bendix turret under, under the chin on the g model which makes a massive difference to survivability so we, we've got a picture of chaplain brown on the right there and um, chaplain brown oddly he's wearing a combat outfit and the reason for that is he did fly on a mission a combat mission he he was awarded an air medal believe it or not which you, you usually got for five combat missions he flew on March the 2nd, 1944, over Frankfurt because he wanted to understand what these guys were going through. Uh, and he browbeat the powers that be into letting him fly and finally got his chance to do it. So he was very happy with that. He now could understand what these guys were going through. He could look them in the eye. This is how he put it. Um, four days later, the 8th Air Force, the 381st, attacked Berlin for the first time. So these were the first American bombs that were dropped on Berlin. Uh, four B-17s were lost from Ridgewell. 69 heavy bombers were lost in total. So it's the 8th Air Force's largest loss of the war on a single mission by the 8th Air Force. And the 8th Air Force was headquarters at Pine Tree. And I think that's on the next slide. That's for, if you can move there on. There we go. Yep. Here we go. Uh, Mike, that's for you. That's Pine Tree. Now. Yeah, so so just a very quick resume of... How do you get there? How do you get this many bombers in the air at once, all going to the same place at the right height and the right correct altitude with the right bomb load and all the rest of it? So basically, it's all done by a system of field orders. So once the weather is good and it looks like a, a mission is likely to be on the target, it's been selected as part of a wider plan, the message comes down to the bomb, respective bomb group headquarters. And they have, a, they have target packs locked away in their operations room, guarded by military police of all the different targets, that in almost like a target book that they, they can be chosen, where they are, what the flight time is, etc. The weather comes in. And, and that then goes out to squadron level. The, the, we mentioned the model crews, the lead navigators and lead bomb aimers are, are summoned. They come in with the commanding officer. They sit down and go, how are we going to do this? Meanwhile, warning orders go out to the engineers, to the bomb, the armourers and everybody else around the station. The station is locked down. Red flags go up, red flares, red lights, depends where you are, especially in the bar saying no more drinking, you're flying in the morning. Uh, and uh, so the cycle begins. And we all we all focus on those lines of B-17s taking off down the runway in sequence. Before that happens, there's this whole thing of working towards zero hour of, of what's the bomb load? what's Where are we going? So what's the fuel load? How much ammunition can we carry? Because all, all this affects the center of gravity of the aircraft. What's the crew composition? If someone's ill, you know, we mentioned this 25, 30, 35 mission counts. If you're ill, you miss a mission. So you're then out of that crew, possibly someone else goes and you, you're back filling aircraft. How many aircraft have we got that's serviceable? Where am I going to fly in the formation? All of that's got to be done. And the first you probably know about it, if you're flying the mission and not in, involved in that planning the loop, that mission planning loop, is at three o'clock in the morning, someone shines a torch in your face, says you're flying, sir. And one of the, somebody comes into the room at night, into your room early hours of the morning and reads the names out, flying today, name, name, name. And then you go to the sketch, you get a quick shave, Quick shout, get something to eat pre-mission. And you, as Paul talked about earlier with um, the three first, the officers went to the briefing. Some bomb groups, everybody went. And Comer's book's very good about this. He talks about what's the point of the, 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 the gunners going. What they, the gunners would do is wait outside, wait till the curtains pulled back and judge by the, the expletives and the size of the groan of what kind of <laughs> mission it was going to be. A nice bomb run to Lille, a nice milk run to Lille or something like that, or... You know, or is it going to be Big, big B Berlin or Schweinfurt again or whatever? They, they go away, set up the aircraft, clean their guns, sort out their ammunition, etc., and make sure that everything was as it should be. And Coma is very good on this again because the first time he goes on a mission, it's chaos. The guns aren't there. The ammunition is not there. It's not this slick machine that we imagine. And it's all being done from here. And it's all working towards zero. And one of the things we found out when we were doing the book was that the crew, the role we're going to talk about ground crew, but the crew chiefs, the aircraft are all lined up in that triangle we saw in the photograph. The one, the main runway is clear, but the aircraft are lined up pre-mission in the takeoff sequence. 
logical, of course, but we all sometimes think they're all sat out in a dispersal and then you all come out in turn. They're all already lined up. And most of the crew chiefs, certainly at Ridgewell, are cleared to taxi the aircraft. So it's not the pilots. They position the crew chief. Will, he owns that aircraft when it's on the ground. He he will move it into into its right place in the takeoff line. And then the crew will come along up by transport and get onto the aircraft. So it's quite important that the Norden bomb sites are going to be unlocked, put in the aircraft, you know, the bomb loads are going to, the bombs are going to be done, the refuel's got to be done, all of that. And then it's got to be set up all on radio silence when they when they start getting in their aircraft. And it's working back from zero when they're going to take off. How long when do you start your engines? Because you can't start too early because you'll burn fuel. If you're going to Berlin or somewhere like that, you need every ounce of fuel you can get. So, you know, when and what is the signal for takeoff and what's the signal for abort, etc. So it's a very complex process, but once it's been done a few times, the template is is there for, for mm-hmm. people to follow. Um, but people talk in their memoirs about whether it's a flag, a flare, or, or, or whatever, and MPs stopping people going out. That last breakfast, now people can't can't eat it, can't face it. Well, they knew it was going to be a bad one, or they got fried eggs, and all those things you read about the same as the RF Bomber Command. So it's it's a fascinating bit. Of this, this is this bit I really found interesting. And I'm going to talk about my box. Yeah. Yeah, so... Sorry. My what question. you get? Yeah, sorry? Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Are we moving on? Yep. Yeah, moving on. So we're talking about a well-oiled machine here for the 8th Air Force and how it was all put together and the plans and such like. But you're still having these accidents occur. So we've got an image there, top left-hand corner. It's actually an oil painting that was painted by a guy called Lawrence Bill Smith, who arrived at Ridgewell uh, at the end of March 1944. And uh, he was here to to picture the 381st, or depict the 381st Victoria. <laughs> so he was painting uh, the medical practice at Ridgewell. And on March 24th, one of the B-17s took off. The crew were a new crew. There were only one mission into their tours. And sadly, this aircraft ended up in this condition at the end of the main runway, uh, a place called Birdbrook. Lawrence Bill Smith painted this photo, uh, painted this uh, picture, uh, death of a B-17. So you were getting these accidents happening time and time again. It was just the way it was, despite having this well-oiled machine. Um, you had some good moments. So, all right, we had Jimmy Doolittle there in the centre of the photograph, uh, centre photograph of the collage. Jimmy Doolittle, head of the 8th Air Force by this time. He's come to Ridgewell. He's come to watch the, the guys coming back in from a mission. They've been over Eschweger in Germany. The guys have seen two B-17s shot down next to them. Two of their fellow crews shot down in flames. And they were forced to make a nice, neat formation pass over Ridgewell for Jimmy Doolittle who, to add insult to injury, had just increased their tours of duty three weeks earlier to 30 missions. So, yeah, he was the guy. He was the famous guy. But at this particular time, he was infamous. But this was quite quite an interesting period for the 381st because two days later, uh, the stars of the stage and screen arrived at Ridgewell. Uh, we have Mary Churchill here christening a B-17 called Stage Door Canteen. And to the very far right of that photograph, you may recognise... Uh, Lawrence Olivier and his wife Vivian Lee. They all came to Ridgewell to to christen this bomber that was named after a, a club in the lo- in the, the 44th Street Theatre in New York. So you, you had these interesting things going on. One minute you've got a B-17 crashing at the end of the runway, then you've got Jimmy Doolittle there, and now you've got Lawrence Olivier and Vivian Lee. So it was all it was all happening, as Mike said, at Ridgewell because of the proximity to London. So um, we talk about generals now. I think my next yeah. Um, slide. Yeah, so um I mean if you look at these, this picture you've got I you can see Eisenhower, that's Kempner on his left, on his right on his right out left. And then to, to Eisenhower's right the second one and you've got uh, two his spats and then Jimmy to do, do a little next to him and then we go down the line and just out of picture you've got a Ron Gentil and uh, Sabatini, the two uh, American fight choices. Um <sighs> these guys are to varying degrees disciples of Billy Mitchell. So this is these are the these these are the, the guys who uh, who really are believe in, in precision daylight bombing, and when you think that at the start of the war, you know, the, the army air corps is exactly that it's part of the army, and as the war progresses more and more, it's, it's quite clear they they grab the, the 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 hand of the Royal Air Force at the start, and Ira Eker, who's not in the picture, is the first commander of the Air Force Bomber Command. He is 
great angler file and he is very complimentary and get, they get all the expertise about how to do stuff in the uk from the royal air force it's, it's a massive factor in how it get and the technology as well it's unreserved they give us all their top secret equipment all their methods it's all being shared by by harris and bomber command but these guys they believe in in not so much completely Mitchell Spax is a bit skeptical about Mitchell and his prophecy about you can win the war with air power alone but they're all they all believe in daylight precision bombing none of them waver and say maybe we should go and uh, bomb by night they all stick to it and Doolittle I think deserves a bit of credit you know he he he's a real tough nut you know we all know about the, the raid on Tokyo and all that but in his early life he's a boxer he works in he goes all prospecting in, in Alaska <coughs> he's a great barnstorming pilot but, but he's a at heart he's a fighter pilot and he's the guy who makes the unpopular decision to take the fighter escort away and say once you've got to the target go and hunt destroy the germans on the ground wherever you find them <coughs> sorry paul do you want to say oh, i've got a bit of a cough now. yeah yeah no problem um so yeah so the, i mean we've seen do little he's arrived at ridgewell he's you know he's annoyed the guys really um you know they've increased his or he's increased their tours of duty so the odds have stretched even thinner for these guys having said that the the luftwaffe the attrition's wearing on the luftwaffe flak is now the main um enemy apart from what, the weather if we move on to the next uh slide please yep. everything has been leading up to this day on the left hand side there everything for the last few months has been leading up to june the 6th and, and d-day as we all know and on that day, the 381st flew two missions. Um, first mission in the morning, second mission in the afternoon. The first mission in the morning was to two uh, strong points uh, overlooking Juno and Gold. Uh, second mission in the afternoon was to a bridge near Caen. Um, unfortunately, the guys in the B-17s never got to see what was going on below because of the cloud cover. Um, and John Howland, who I spoke about earlier on, a navigator with the 381st, who would eventually go on to become a pathfinder navigator. Really interesting guy, takes up a lot of the book. He uh, He's he's a bit perplexed by this D-Day mission. They get called out at 22.30 the evening before, June the 5th. So they sat down, everyone knows something's up. Curtain's pulled back on the map of Europe. Colonel Lieber says, right, this is it. Uh, this is it, men. This is this is happening. D Day is happening, and when uh, Howland's told about the, the the bomb load that they're taking, they're carrying twenty one hundred pound demolition bombs, and so he's questioning. Hang on a minute, twenty hundred pound <coughs> demolition bombs are not really going to do a great deal of damage to these strong points that we keep talking about. Then he's told, actually, no, these are going to be making foxholes for the troops on the beaches. So quite an interesting thing for these 381st guys to, to do, flying a different way and bombing a different way. You're bombing line abreast over the beaches of, of Normandy. So as I say, two, two, two missions on, on D-Day, no bombers lost, no attacks by the Luftwaffe. And this was one of 15 missions that were carried out by the 381st between May and June um, uh, during uh, 1944. Um, one year anniversary, June 22nd, 1944, the 381st atta attacked a power station in Tongri near Abbeville. A few days later, the guy in the center of the photograph here arrived at Israel, the movie gangster, Edward G. Robinson. He turned up to christen a bomber uh, that was called Happy Bottom, which perplexed a few people when he said it's named after my wife. His wife's name Gladys, but he mispronounced it and called her Gladass. So everyone knew it's Happy Bottom. Uh, unfortunately, Happy Bottom only lasted 11 days. It ditched in the North Sea. Uh, the crew got out, didn't get their feet wet, but uh, Happy Bottom is still at the bottom of the North Sea. And then into July, the 381st took off on a mission to Munich. And once again, we have another accident very close to the base. Uh, the pilot and the co-pilot of this aircraft got out miraculously. Uh, but unfortunately, seven others on board, they were killed when the bomb load erupted. So just another accident to add to the litany of, of accidents that took place at Ridgewell. Can we move on to the next? Yep. So we're going into August. Uh, the 381st is going off to Pienemunde. Pienemunde being the main um, 
uh, rocket establishment, the, the, the experimental rocket establishment on the Baltic. And during this mission, just after takeoff, a B-17 known as Dry Gulcher, it was the Pathfinder B-17, it was equipped with this H-2X radar, uh, it caught fire. And the pilot, Irving Moore, he instructed his crew to bail out. Uh, he, he tried to hold the bomber while they were bailing out. Uh, the flames in the cockpit came through. He tried to open the window. It fanned the flames. He, he tried to get out the window. He couldn't. Uh, finally, he decided, I'm going to have to run through and jump out the bomb bay, which he did. Um, he managed to survive bailing out. He, he paralyzed himself, actually, for three weeks after this. Uh, a couple of other crew members broke their ankles, uh, but there was one crew member who was killed, unfortunately, and this was the tail gunner, Henry Norris. Uh, but interesting story about Irving Moore. He would go on to uh, direct Dallas and Dynasty, the 80s TV series. In fact, he, dir mm. he directed uh, Who Shot JR? Wow. Celebrities. There we go. We've got another celebrity on the right. He came in September 1944, Bing Crosby. Played a two-hour show on September the 2nd. And this took place just a few weeks before Operation Market Garden, which we all know was the, the um, attempt to uh, uh, make a crossing over the Rhine. The 381st took part in that mission. Uh, the aircraft bombed individually. They were given map coordinates, the crew, for individual sites. And this caused a lot of problems, a lot of intermingling on the bomb runs. Uh, but one of the aircraft flew that mission, carried Lewis Brereton, who was one of the architects of uh, Operation Market Garden. So uh, Brereton and also a journalist flew on board this aircraft. The journalist was quite impressed with the B-17, although one of his words were, well, you know, thoughts are for killing, not for comfort. Yeah. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, Paul. Thank you very much. And this is for Mike. About yeah, quickly, just working to talk about the actual crew composition. We talked about the where they came from, where they recruited from, just who does what on the aircraft. And then we start obviously in the cockpit with the pilot and co-pilot. Um, often these guys had equal an equal amount of training, or you know, and it was like one guy had one more missions than the other, or it was in theatre before the other one arrived. So it wasn't necessarily that the fact that the guy who was the commander was was the better candidate is just the way the way it worked and it was back, the b-17 was quite a complex aircraft to fly synchronizing the four engines and the turbochargers and there's lots to talk about particularly when you're trying to maintain a formation if you're flying as an individual aircraft then it's different and the RAF crew's 90 squadron referred to it as a, a grand lady it was fantastic it would get you home it was great aircraft to fly but actually maintaining it in a combat box was with all the turbulence and slip stream was, was it took a lot of skill on the throttles uh, and you almost had to be the good co-pilot and pilot were um, almost telepathic. They know without looking at each other what to do, when to do it, just to keep the aircraft in trim and keep it flying along. So forward of them, we've got the bomb aimer and the navigator. Um, so the, the bomb aimer, yeah, it might just be a toggle here. Later in the war, you know, there were not, not enough northern bomb sites to go around. Not every aircraft had one. So if you're flying in a formation in that combat box, you'd wait till the lead bomb aimer opened his bomb doors, you'd open your bomb doors. When he dropped, you all dropped together. Now, that sounds quite rudimentary, but when they all had northern sights in the early days, they were missing the target. They were spreading all over the place because the settings and the way inter interpretation, whereas if your box was tight, and this was one of the, not only because of defence, but also for bombing pattern, the tighter the formation, the tighter the bomb uh, drop on the bomb, uh, dispersal of the bombs on the target. So... Um, Toggle here might be a, a, a waste gunner. Later in the war, he went down from crew of um, 10 to 9. It might be a waste gunner retrained just to which button to, to do, how to fuse the bombs, how to drop the bombs. And, and that, he'd wait for the lead bomb aimer to drop his bombs and away they go. But uh, responsible position, you're also operating the, the guns in the front as well. And there's always a bit of banter and you read about it in all the memoirs and you can imagine it between the enlisted men in the back who are trained air gunners and the guys in the front who have got other jobs and, and fire a gun now and again. So there's a lot of a lot of that officers can't shoot stuff going on. Um, and, and so that's the navigator, very important, uh, if, especially if you lose formation. On the way back, time and time again, you read about these guys form falling out of formation because of an engine problem or being damaged or whatever, and then having to fly at low level back across France or the Netherlands to get to the channel to get home. And it's all down to the navigator with leaking fuel and all that. Everyone suddenly zooms in on the navigator. It's over to you, mate. You've got to get us back. So he's a... He's a very important guy. Good navigators are, are, are much sought after. 
moving back and then just behind the, the two pilots, up and down behind him is the engineer. On takeoff, he will be hands on shoulders looking over all the gauges. So he, he knows the aircraft well in conjunction with the crew chief. He manages it, but he also mans the, the upper turret. So he's a gunner, he's a trained gunner and he's an engineer. So quite a versatile guy. Uh, and um, as we move back, we've got the two, uh, the two waste gunners who are manning a 50 caliber each. Working back to back, and if you look at the the early B-17s, the windows are directly opposite each other, so they're getting each other's way. So then they stagger the windows so the guys aren't in each other's way, uh, so they can move around to, to fire. And you would think that would be the most hazardous position to be of all the gunners, but actually, um, all the ball turret. A lot of people talk about the ball turret, and it is hazardous when you're landing. If you're trapped in it, obviously it's deadly. But actually, it's armoured, partly armoured, so it's not that bad a place to be. It's, as Paul said, nose and tail, not a good place to be. Waste gunner is very exposed. Uh, ball turret gunner, usually quite a small guy. It had to be to get inside that turret. Uh, and the uh, obviously, that you look at, you watch Star Wars, you see those turrets in Star Wars on the Millennium Falcon and all that inspiration from the B-29 and ball turrets, etc. They're quite, it's quite a lonely position that and the tail, tail gunner, and, and it's quite a difficult position to to, to be in, I think. And um, nobody are, is in those turrets on takeoff and landing. Everyone gets out and moves to where the radio operator is in the centre of the aircraft. And on takeoff and landing, that's where you are. And often, when you hear about German night fighters following B-70s back at dusk into the circuit, like where, I, where I'm sat now in Mendelsham, they're following the guys because and none of the guns are manned. Everyone's sat there thinking, oh, we've done that now. We're going to land. We're in the safest place on the aircraft. So that's uh, moving back. And then the last man literally in the aircraft at the back is the tail gunner. Uh, and he's a busy guy. He's got a lot to do. And it's interesting that... Sometimes, on a, if you were the lead ship, the tail gunner wouldn't fly in there. The co-pilot would move back into that position, and he would operate the tail gunner the tail, in the tail gun position. And the mission commander would kick the co-pilot, would take his seat, you know, a one star or general or something, in the co-pilot seat, leading the mission, as often happens. So you suddenly get to sit this one out, and uh, you'd have your co-pilot at the back. And his task was to inform the general at the front as to where the boxes were, how the formation was flying, where the German fighters were. Situational awareness of, as from a pilot's perspective, describing all of that. All of them have to work together. It's a great picture of them coming back here on, on that Jeep. That's a, that's a Ridgewell picture. Um, and, it, and it all hinges on a 22, 23-year-old pilot. He's in charge of, of that crew. Crazy. Uh, yeah. Down to 19. And you've heard about the attrition rates, you know, and, and the horrible deaths of these guys died. Um, in the cold, and they always call it the cold blue. We always talk about fire. Right. And that... Wondering whether you're going to get out, whether the, the, the bell's going to go. There's a bell on a B-17, so we're abandoning the aircraft. So, and is that working? And all those stories Paul talked about where half the crew's gone and half still in it and the aircraft flies on or, or not. It is, uh, there's some great stories about guys still firing the guns as the B-17 sinks into the water and all. It really is an amazing thing, that, things that they did as, as crews and uh, the attrition rate. And the horror of fighting in that environment and the sudden death is, is quite quite staggering. Brilliant, Paul. Enough. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, so we're talking about ground crews in a second, and you've got a good example here of a ground crew cleaning the nose of a B-17. He's uh, cleaning it with baking powder to make sure that these guys have got a clear view. Um, this aircraft was known as Schnozzle, and Schnozzle was the nickname of Jimmy Durante, an American comedian. And it was named Schnozzle because the crew of the time thought it, the nose of the B-17 looked like Jimmy Durante's. Um, but unfortunately, even though this guy's cleaning the, the nose cone of this B-17, the crew of Schnozzle would not see another crew of a B-17 called Egg Hade on January the 21st, 1945, when they were coming back from Germany. They were in a landing circuit over Ridgewell. Uh, the landing circuit was a circular uh, anti-clockwise route. And during the process of peeling off to land, two of the B-17s collided, one of them Schnozzle, another one Egghead. Both aircraft came down 1,500 feet, half a mile from the end of the runway. These guys had just been over Germany, and all 18 were killed. And Chaplin Brown really struggled with this kind of accident, you know, what do I tell the families back home kind of thing. That was the, the daily struggle this guy had. On the right there, we have a picture of Conway Hall. He was the third and final commanding officer of the 381st Bomber Group. Conway Hall had been with the group since it was established in Pio. He was Air Executive, Operations Officer, Deputy Commander. He eventually took over from Harry Lieber um, at the end of uh, February 1945. 
So a nice guy, he was very happy to help uh, Chaplin Brown go on this combat mission in March 1944. Um, he said it would be good, actually, if you go down in combat, because at least we'll all get some peace and quiet from you keep <laughs> asking us about going on a mission. So he was a great advocate for, for, for Chaplin Brown. But yeah, we're going to talk about the ground crews very quickly, I think, Mike. Um, yeah. Ground crews, key to the, to the bomb group, really. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I would say this because I've been a ground crew member, but, you know, look at the number of ground crews to, to generate an aircraft, and, and you've got your engine fitters, your, your electricians, your armourers, your, 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 all these guys who work on do different jobs on the aircraft under the crew chief. And it, it's a perception thing. We just think we don't talk about these guys much. It, it, all, all the women, you know, the first the Red Cross women on the air stations and all, all the women's army who do the switchboards and the medics and all, it's, it's, a, it's a huge organisation. But, you know, if you're going to put 10, 10 guys on each aircraft and fly them off, that, that still leaves the balance of the 2,000 people who are involved in generating those aircraft and putting them into the air. And the majority of those are these ground crew. And, they, they yeah, they've got they've got blocks or, or Nissan huts that they live in, and they, they do have a life. And actually, probably, most of the big hangar parties, which you see in all the Hollywood movies and Memphis Bell, etc., that's ground crew. Because the, the pilots who have got any time off, they're out there. They're in a flak house or they're in London uh, doing the uh, – so they're – um, but uh, they live quite a rough, rough life. If you think about the size of an airfield, Ridgeville's a great example. You know, if you are a crew chief and you say, okay, guys, lunch is at 12.30, it takes half an hour to get there, half an hour to eat it, half an hour to get out. That's 90 minutes of maintenance time I've lost. So these guys didn't really get back, and, and a lot of them lived in packing crates or under canvas on the dispersal neck of their aircraft. And if they're working through the night in all elements, all, round, all year round, they're exposed to that. So... And they, they they invest in those aircraft. They you know, it's their airframe. So when they talk about missions coming back, and the Padre talk, Chaplin talks about it really well, and everyone does about sweating out a mission. Once your B seventeen is locked and loaded and gone and taken off at the end of the runway without crashing, you then wait it to see if it's going to come back. And then it doesn't come back, and all those ten guys you knew didn't come back. Um, so they have a long war. Uh, it's not without hazard. We've heard about the the Caroline explosion. We've heard it. You know, they're working in quite a dangerous environment on the ground, but you know they're not going to—they're not flying over Berlin, admittedly. But they are living a quite an exposed life out on the dispersal in the, in the T four hangars, etc. T two hangars, exposed to all of the elements, and without them, it, it's not happening. It's yeah. just worth mentioning because the ground crews came up in the sidebar. Is that it, like with the chaplains? Is that we often our frame of reference for any bomb group is often with the flyers, but of course the flyers aren't always there for a huge amount of time. They may just be there for a few few days yeah. or weeks. But the ground crews are there for an extended period. I was talking, I'm name dropping to Stuart Lee, the comedian, about his grandfather was ground crew on RAF base and how he yeah. was really suffer from PTSD because it was five years of yeah. seeing aircraft coming back with dead people inside them. Five years of, 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 yeah. of another aircraft not coming back, another aircraft coming back. So although they're, they're not in the same danger, although, as Paul said, there are occasional accidents on the, on the base, they're, they're, they are there at the emotional front line for a much longer extended period of time. So I'm glad we've got Sophie Green coming on later in the week to talk about the, the women in, attached to the 8th Air Force, because, again, they're going to be there for an arguably longer period of time, seeing that much more progressive amounts of death because, of you know, you're making friends with lots of people who then don't come back. So I think... Yeah. Uh, a healthy nod to the ground crews, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you'll, you'll see this on the next slide, Paul, because unfortunately it did affect them at Ridgewell. Um, so the top left-hand photo there is of Miss Florala. It was named Miss Florala because the crew, the co-pilot, pilot, and one of the other officers were from Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama. Um, but unfortunately this aircraft was the last B-17 that was shot down in combat. Uh, last 381st B-17 to be lost. That was April the 8th. But we talked about the ground crews and how they were kind of, you know, they, yeah, you would see crashes, people killed and so on. These guys were actually fully involved with it, unfortunately, at the end of the war, April the 23rd, 1945. These guys have been at Ridgewell for two years. Uh, Conway Hall, commanding officer, he decided, you know, they haven't seen any of the country. They need to go and see something of it. Let's give them a 72-hour pass let's take them to, to Northern Ireland. So this B-17 took off April the 23rd. It was uh, loaded with 26 passengers, a dog, five crew, took off, uh, heading for Nuts Corner, Northern Ireland. And unfortunately, it didn't reach there because we can see in the centre photo there, 
the wreckage of this aircraft on a hillside on the Isle of Man. This is North Barrel, it's the Isle of Man's second highest peak. Um, the aircraft crashed into it in, in thick cloud. And it was believed that the pilot uh, was trying to look for the spot where his friend had come to grief nine months earlier. His friend had crashed on the same mountain. So there's all kinds of conjecture, but what we do know is 31 people were killed, 26 of whom were ground crew members. So a really sad end to the war. Uh, I think, yeah, I think another, another interesting another interesting one of the slides that Paul showed earlier is uh, you look inside the fuselage, all the cables and wire are all exposed. So all the control cables, are, if you've got 26 people in an MV-17, someone at some point is going to lean on one of those control cables or or, or damage them or whatever. It's, it's um, It just wasn't designed for 20. No, it's 20 a bomber. Yeah. <laughs> but we can see in the next photo that it was used again, the B-17, for ferrying, crew, uh, ferrying passengers. And this is at the end of the war. This is after VE Day. This is May the 12th. This is Operation Revival. And this is where B-17s have been sent to Bath in Germany to collect POWs from Stalag Luft 1. So they were loading about 30 POWs at a time on these aircraft to get them out of Germany. Um, the 381st, you know, finished up the war, um, you know, 165 B-17s lost, 1,290 men were casualties. Uh, it dropped 22,000 tonnes of bombs. It left uh, Ridgewell, uh, all B-17s. And the rest of the crews, the ground echelon, they went uh, by July the 17th. They went back on the Queen Elizabeth as they'd arrived two years, almost exactly two years earlier. It's quite amazing. Hmm. If we move on to the next slide, I will show you what happened some 37 years later. So the 381st was deactivated on the 28th of August 1945. And in 37 years to the day of that deactivation, about 100 veterans and their wives came back to Ridgewell. Uh, to dedicate this memorial to the 381st, which is outside the front of our museum, the Ridgewell Airfield Museum. Um, and we can see Chaplain Brown in all his glory here, stood in front of the memorial in his Class A uniform, which he kept. He turned up at Heathrow Airport wearing this, by all accounts. Um, and a great guy, really great guy. He lived to 107, died on Christmas Day 2008. Wow. And the guy on the right there, um, we talked about uh, Friday the 13th, the B-17 that was shot down during big week. Um, this is Casey Bukowski. He was a left waist gunner on Friday the 13th. Six of his crew were killed in action. He was incapacitated. He bailed out unconscious, uh, taken prisoner by the Germans. He lost an eye. Uh, Stalag Luft 4 for a year, and then he was force marched across Germany, and he got back home to the States. But he never came back to Ridgewell until September 2019. So 75 years from when he first took off. And that is him standing at the end of the runway. And he is in the prologue of Bomb Group, the book that Mike and I have just written. Brilliant. Well, that's it. We're um, a fantastic presentation, gents. And the only request is, is that you, you two come back and do a question and answer, because obviously we went on a, it was a bit more detailed than we, we, we thought. So we can come back and do a question and answer sometime later on. That'd be really good. Maybe either in the second Wraith Air Force week I do, or just a, a, another date that suits us all, but that'd be fantastic. So um, just the last final, final question, obviously it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a book for 2022, it's not so much aimed at people who served in B-17s, but families. But what are your hopes for the book in terms of uh, the readership? You know, you, war buffs generally, people from the people who live near the bases, just it's, anyone really. It's, a, it's a bit of both, Paul. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, the, uh, when I first discovered this story, I was thinking, well, you know, I, I consider myself an aviation geek and even I didn't know about this. So if there's people like me who think they know about it, then there's obviously a lot more that don't. And mm. I think the way it's written and the, the, in the personal stories, it's going to resonate with a lot of people, hopefully. Would you say, Mike? Yeah, yeah I think um, we, saw, we spoke at the start about context and Paul's very modest about it. And you've just seen his knowledge. It's just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's huge. The, the thread of human human story that goes through this, and he brings that narrative, is fantastic. And, and, and uh, there's there's an overview and context all the way through it, and that's the idea. So it, it, it's it's I think we think it's a readable book, and the idea is for anyone. It's not well, just if, it, if it's as good as the, the day's show. It's got the micro and the macro. It's got that it, you know the individual crews, the loss of life of of, of you know the people saying the sidebar. You know 
the loss of one person is a tragedy to the family, but also that that overall narrative of where the Eighth Air Force is going and how a bomb group works as part of a much larger organization. Because without that, without that context, it's it's the personal stories don't have the um the same kind of um, understanding for me. So I think it's perfect. So I can't wait to get my copy. So folks, I'm going to bring it to end now because another show is starting in ten minutes' time. So I'll have just the time for a quick a quick whiz and a drink, a drink of water, and we'll be back there. So folks, um, I, I urge you to go out there and buy this book by Mike and Paul, and I will look forward to seeing you again for a question and answer. So. This is Paul Dad, uh, Mike and Paul for World War II TV saying I'll see you all next time, which is in fact Thank 10 you. minutes time. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.